everyone. This is your Yarntastic Four podcast number three. My name is Bronislava, and I have here again my three super cool ladies. I have here Kelly, Afifa, Hi. Liné, and today's topic or theme is going to be stranded color work. Now, uh, uh, Liné was very, very good student <laughs> and she gave us lots of questions. So many questions that I'm not really sure if, it, if we can go and cover it up in, uh, you know, cover the, all the questions in this, uh, in this uh, video. But let me go and pick, or actually, Liné should be asking all these questions. <laughs> I have my list right here in front of me. So the first one, let's see. For Kelly, tools that can be used to help yarn organization. Oh, okay. Yarn organization, holding multiple strands at once. So there's a bunch of different tools out there and they're like, you know, it's really like, what are you into? What feels comfortable? And um, what do you like? The like on the very, very extreme low end, I've seen people use little sandwich bags and poke a hole through them <laughs> and keep their yarn in different sandwich bags and then use that uh, to guide the yarn through in order to keep it uh, somewhat organized. Uh, so that's like at the like lowest tech level. And then there's, um, I mean, this one is not the most glamorous, but I actually find it to be the most uh, effective for me. Actually, I don't even wear it on that finger. I wear it on this finger. Um, and then you can actually guide your yarn through um, the hole as you are using it. And what I like about this is that um, it's not a complete ring. So, you know, you can take your yarn in and out. Uh, whereas some of the yarn guides there, you know, you have to like pull it through and then you're like, okay, I'm stuck with this forever. So it's nice to have that little um, uh, opening so that you can change where you're guiding the yarn. And um, I like this one because it's quite big, but there are some that are like super beautiful and ornate and you can even get, you know, like, a, like 14 karat gold, some really beautiful um, accessories, but this is just an example of, of one. And I've seen a lot of people use these and use them to great effect. So then you've got your classic yarn bowl, right? So depending upon what yarn bowl you have and how big it is and how big your work is, you can utilize various different yarn bowls to separate your, um, your strands. I actually tend to use either a yarn bowl or, um, and here's like a soft one, you know, that's really cute by Delacue. Uh, and it has a little strap. And what I like about the strap again is the fact that um, you can remove the closure. So Delacue has all kinds of really beautiful accessories. I really like that brand. Speaking of Delacue, um, this is the other, this is my favorite. I have one of these myself. Um, it's um, made by Namaste. Again, they have a lot of beautiful accessories too. And I just think, oh, oh and they're changing their branding to uh, Delacue. So that will be happening shortly. But I still have the Namaste uh, brand in my shop. And this is my favorite color. It's kind of that dirty ballerina slipper pink. What I like about this case, not only does it remind me of like a retro 50s makeup case, is the fact that it has a yarn guide, which again, you can remove. So many of the yarn bowls, and I think Bronislava was showing me hers earlier, um, they have uh, holes or grommets in them 
uh, or not the yarn bowls, but like bags will have grommets in them or yarn bowls will have holes in them. But actually, once you've got your yarn in there, that's it. You're stuck. Whereas um, having that gap means that you can make your uh, project portable. But what I also like about this is that it comes with a number of different accessories, like these little bags, these little pouches. And you can have multiple pouches because these actually slide around. It's magnetic. Oh. So, so it has a metal there. Yeah. So you can place these in any way you wish. And then, you know, if you, let's say you were using three different uh balls of yarn at the same time, you could have three little, you know, three of the little project bags and you could keep them nice and tidy and safe. I think the most important thing really is just what's comfortable for you in terms of um, keeping your, uh, your yarn separated. I've also seen people use bobbins um, and um, wrap their yarn around the bobbins to also then keep those safe too. So I don't know, have you, do you, do you all use different techniques when you're doing your, to keep your yarn separated? What's your? What's I used your... to have, uh, I used to have um, a Norwegian thimble, I think it's called, the metal one that oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, has, and you can actually also take the yarn in and out because it has just the. Little coil. Yes. Yeah, that's what I had. And then this, like I showed you, like what you yeah. said, this one has two holes, so I could go and do color work with this bowl as well. This the thin bowl? I've had yes. this. That's the, that's the one. That's yes. I lost it. <laughs> I lost it. Yes, yes. That's the Norwegian thin bowl. Yeah. Yeah. This, it hasn't turned my finger green because I'm, I have an, a metal allergy. It'll if it's fake, it'll turn my fingers and my it's, ears. It's stainless and steel. It's very okay. well made. Mm -hmm. You can smell the steel on this for sure. Um, there's definitely the metal scent, but you can't move it at all. That's why I was looking for a new um, tool to keep on my finger for at least two colors because this thing, it's pretty stiff. It, it doesn't move, you can't change the shape of it or anything. And it only seems to come in two sizes, um, which isn't bad, but for anyone who you know it won't work for, needs another option. Lene, um, go ahead. I owe you so much stuff. I've got like an emerald green with your name on it. I owe you so many things and maybe I'll send you this too, because That's I think you might like this a little bit better. I like that. Now, what is that around your finger? Is that metal or? Okay, it's a metal ring. Okay. And it's it's adjustable. I'm like <laughs> looking. I want to see real close. <laughs> no, you're doing good job. You're doing good job. We see it. <laughs> and me, um, uh, I'll send one to you to Bronislava if you um, if you want one. I don't need as much uh, stranded uh, color works. Uh, I think Afifa probably works, uh, does Afifa. a lot of those. So what did you want to s say, Afifa? Sorry. Oh, I said I want one. Well, <laughs> I, Afifa, you can just come in and take it. Like, I, I, know. I, I just use yarn socks. Oh, yarn yeah. socks? Yeah, they're just little like stretchy socks, I guess. You know, the, they look like a beer cozy, but they're made out of stretchy material. Oh, I thought those were called yarn cozies. Yeah. Is that the other? Sure. One? Mine are called skein wranglers. Okay. So yeah, I, I just like that because I'm working on something with where I've divided the balls up right now. Um, so there's like your you have three skeins attached, but it's uh, it's kind of hard to explain. But anyway, so I'm using yarn socks because I was having like my yarn was basically flying all over the place and it was making me crazy. Oh, just, I just want to let you know, I'm going to mute when I'm not talking because there's pounding happening next door and I don't want it to be on the recording. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Can you guys hear it? A little bit. It sounds okay. Like knocking it okay, out. good. <laughs> Another question for Kelly. When it comes to color work, 
how do you keep your yarn from bleeding? So I have a pair of socks, and I, I mentioned this, I think, on the first podcast. Oh, that's a great it was question. Self-striping yarn, which looks like color work, yeah. but it was red and white. So if you have a sweater that you're doing color work on, such as Afifa's Mad BT here. Yeah, look at that. Look at Afifa, look at your color work right there. <laughs> I will put another link below. You you said that uh, you you are gonna go and be giving a free pattern until July, end of July. So for should... the cow, yeah, not for the sweater. The cow, a cow, yes. Yeah. And that's Kelly's yarn, right? It is. I have, and it is called. So I don't get it wrong. Glamour Jane is pretty in pink frosting. And then Kelly was kind enough to give, this is color number three in the pattern, a sweno, this blue. And then I have for color number four, a darker blue. So I absolutely love this pattern, Fifa. I, I really do. Let me see it again, please. Yes. This is just yeah. the top down. It's beautiful. Look how those colors work so well together. Yeah, I love the eyelets. Yeah, it's really oh, pretty. Hey, I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah, really pretty. So Kelly, how do I yeah. wash this? I love that you're not that. wearing it or gifting it. So for washing and laundering, how yeah. do you get the colors to not bleed onto each other with the yarn? I love that you asked that question because so many people assume that superwash yarn means that it won't bleed. And that's absolutely not true. The superwash coating, actually, not that you have superwash because you don't, but the superwash coating actually prevents the fibers from felting. It does not prevent the dye necessarily from bleeding. The only way in which you can really be assured that your uh, color combination isn't going to bleed together is to do a, a, a swatch. And I always recommend when people are putting various different colors together that the very first thing that they do is a little swatch, give it a little bath, make sure that it doesn't bleed. If it does bleed, then you might want to choose different yarn because it could end up becoming quite a, a problem and ruining your, um, ruining, you know, your, your, product, whether it be a sweater or a cowl or a scarf or whatever, uh, uh, whatever it is that you're making. And it's devastating. And I've had that happen to customers that have bought various different yarns, put them together, and then given it a bath and it's bled and they're devastated. And they put all this incredible hard work into something only for it to be ruined. So um, there are color catchers that you can put in um, uh, they're like little sheets that will, you know, draw color, but that doesn't necessarily stop the bleeding either. There are also ways in which, let's say you do your swatch, you find that there's a particular yarn that's bleeding. You can um, do um, either with citric acid or vinegar, you can um, do a process by which you kind of like reset the dye with the yarn. It's not easy and heat really needs to be a part of that process. Some people say, oh, just put it in some vinegar and that will do it. Actually, it needs vinegar plus a little bit of heat in order to make that set. So you can look up on YouTube and, um, and find um, you know, processes where you could, you could also um, buy food grade citric acid and do that as well if you found that a color was bleeding onto another. Or embrace the bleed and be okay with it. And that sometimes happens. Now with your particular socks, the um, red and white socks, really that should not have happened. Because if a dyer is creating, like say doing a dip dye or a technique whereby they're creating self-striping, uh, then really it's very, very important for the dyer to, be, to, to make sure that that has been set in such a way that it doesn't, it doesn't bleed. I have one out of my, I have 12 colors for my new um, woolen spun yarn. And I have 22 colors of my worsted spun yarn. 
I only have, and they're all natural dyes and they're non superwash. I only have one that actually bleeds. No matter what I do in terms of like a double, triple setting process, the indigo just naturally um, uh, comes off on your hands a little bit. And then when you give it its first wash, the water turns blue, no matter what I do. And that's not unusual for indigo dye, but it's also very frustrating. But I make sure that I warn every single person that purchases that particular colorway, hey, by the way, this is gonna get on your hands. It may rub off on your needles. And once you give it its initial soak, it's gonna turn the water blue, but after that, it's pretty good. So um, I hope that answers your question. It does. I do still have a follow-up. Yeah. Do have to do if, let's say you're doing the vinegar. Yeah. Uh, or whatever the process that you're utilizing for the first wet blocking, you know, when you're off the needles and everything. Yeah. Do you have to do that again and again and again? to ensure that the bleed does not happen on consecutive washings. Hopefully you have done your swatch and you've established that your yarn is bleeding because then what you're gonna to wanna to do is before you ever do your garment, you're gonna take that hank and you're going to, um, to do it at that stage. So you're not going to do it afterward. You're going to create the prevention before you even start because you may be in the situation where you can't prevent it, where no matter what you do, it continues to bleed, in which case you're going to be like, well, I'm going to save that for a project all on its own and replace it with um, a different yarn. A friend of mine was asking me about that when we were talking about color work and she was like, I wonder if I could just wash the skein of yarn or the hank of yarn itself. If I find out that it is bleeding, can I just wash the skein of yarn? Let I wouldn't it dry and then use it. I wouldn't recommend that. What okay. I would recommend would be to set the yarn using okay. either a vinegar or um, uh, and use that process instead of trying to wash the yarn. Okay. Um, because the idea isn't to wash away the color, but rather to retain the color, if that makes sense. And I, I have no idea. I mean, I think it would be a tangled mess if you tried to wash yarn. I don't know. Have any of you ever tried that? I haven't. I think it would be a disaster, but, you know, maybe somebody else, maybe one of Bronislava's viewers will be like, I did it and I had a fantastic result. Or somebody will be like, I did it and it was a nightmare. So let us know. Exactly, that would be great. Great if they can go and uh, comment below our video. Um, I was also um, taken a little bit aback right now by you telling me that, or us basically, that it is better to go and use vinegar uh, with heat. I didn't know that. That's very, very interesting. I, I, I always do it like, you know, with a cold water. Yeah, it's, it's not, um, uh, so there's, there's a million and one people that will tell you soak it in vinegar and that will help it and uh, it may help it a little bit but during the dye process part of that is um, a, a heat process where you literally can put it in a pan and gently heat it and that's it, like basically you would look up how to set dye in yarn and when you look that up on YouTube, and I'll find some videos, and then we can put a couple of, well, Bronislava can put a couple of links in there. Literally, you're going to repeat the process that the hand dyer would have done in terms of setting the dye. It's like setting the dye another time, and then that helps to retain uh, the colors. But without the heat, it's probably not terribly effective. Because I colored a uh, couple yarns and I used just vinegar and it took. Yes. Well, 
I mean, it created absolutely beautiful shade. Yes. But if, you know, not strong. And I'm wondering if it would go and help to set it even stronger. It depends on the dye that you're using and it depends on whether or not your dye, <clears throat> whether the vinegar set has done its job. Mm. I use natural, natural. I used petals and beets. And then did you um, heat set it? I heat set the dye, but not the uh not not the uh the, the vinegar did you have a mordant in the no it no. was wool so you don't need you don't need mordant for the wool okay well right. some of the dye some of the dyes you depending upon what you're using and um and uh, <laughs> i'm <nature>. sorry <laughs> We, this should be another another uh, podcast. Okay. We're getting away from what we're supposed to talk about. <laughs> oh. I have another question for Kelly. Is there a not is there, but are there better yarns, yarn types to use for color work? Mohair versus lace versus wool versus woolen spun versus Aaron versus DK worsted, blah, blah, blah. Is there something better versus the other for color work? I would say the answer is all yarn is great for color work. Um, mohair might be a little sticky, which is both a benefit and a curse, depending upon what you're doing with it. Uh, but I'd say all, all yarn is fantastic for, for color work. It just depends on the fabric that you're trying to make. And I think, you know, just in yarn in general, um, uh, you know, understand that when you're doing stranded color work, your product is going to be thicker um, because you're going to have, in some instances, this, you know, the floats behind. So that creates thickness and so you know if you're if you're doing it for the first time and you're like oh I really want the weight of a nice DK sweater well understand that if your entire sweater is stranded color work it's not going to feel your fabric's not going to feel like DK it's going to feel much more like worsted so it's just being mindful of the the, the fabric that you want to create and when using mohair, should it be just use the mohair as it comes off the skein, or should you double it to make it thicker so it stands out in the color work? It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Like uh, a lot of people use mohair um, together with another fiber in order to create that beautiful like fluff on top of a strand. Some people are using two strands of mohair um, held double in order to create its own fabric. Uh, some people, I, I think the ranunculus, there are some versions of the ranunculus that are just a mohair and it's really light and beautiful and gorgeous and, and just very kind of see-through. It's not color work, but again, it just depends on, on the pattern, what the pattern calls for and the look that you're trying to achieve. Okay. Okay. Those are my questions for Kelly. Uh, regarding the, uh, the type of yarn, I heard that it also depends how the yarn is um, um, put together, woven or whatever you call it. Clyde? Clyde, yes. Yeah. That if it's like whichever way, you know, like it's very... Um, like you have strands of yarn that is like oh, whether brushed. it's or worsted spun, yeah. So yeah, that can that can. Or if it's like you know, in all different directions, if the yeah. you know, that can have an impact on your finished product. So for example, um, if you're using a woolen uh, a woolen spun where all of the um, 
uh, strands are in different directions. Yes, uh, that that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're doing um, stranded color work, um, that can kind of fill in the gaps a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love about that is that um, you know it's a it's a beautiful yarn. It's a beautiful yarn to use if you want to just kind of like you know when you wash it, it's just going to expand a little bit, and you can kind of like. Sh mush it into um into place and so um if you have a little inconsistency with your stitches it can hide a multitude of sins and um then if you're doing um what most people are using which is a worsted spun where all the fibers are combed in the same direction you're going to get a, a smoother um a smoother finish so, yeah yeah and that's where you can see more mistakes in yeah. um, well, not mistakes, tension is maybe yeah, uneven, you know? Yeah. I have a question for Afifa. How do you best handle, when you're working with a pattern, um, the floats? I always hear the rumor of catch your floats every four or five stitches. I heard actually on a knit night with Royal Bee Yarn Company, someone <laughs> said they heard forget the floats, just let it go. <laughs> and that's kind of scary. Um, but any suggestions on how to catch the float and keep your tension as well? Yeah, um, I like to catch the floats every four to five stitches because if you just let it go, then your fingers get stuck. I mean, think about where you're, this is a garment you're gonna be wearing those extra strings that aren't caught are gonna get stuck on everything like even just getting it over your head just imagine if i had a float that was like 20 stitches it's gonna get stuck on my head as i'm trying to put it on um so uh, let me show you this this is just a really simple color work it's just little squares and on the back of this like right here can you guys see that that I've got it caught every four stitches. And then up here, I've got smaller squares. Do I? Yeah. And those are like every two stitches. And like Kelly said, it's like, it's a much thicker fabric, but I don't have here, I'm not going to get stuck on anything most likely. Like if I try and do that, if the floats were bigger, my fingers would get stuck in there or like my ring would get stuck in there. Um, and as far as tension goes for, I just always leave more than I think I'm going to need because when I block it, it's going to stretch. And if I don't leave more, I leave about a half more than I think I'm going to need. So when I'm knitting it, it feels really loose, but when I block it, it blocks out so much more evenly. Does that make sense? Totally. So when you're creating your float, you're not just pulling it not tight but sometimes I stick my finger in there before I catch it okay if that helps that helps so when you know this is blocked unblocked it would look a little bit more like this so it would pop out a little bit and you'd be like oh that's too loose and then you'd have a tendency to pull it to make it tighter mm -hmm. but then when you block it it's going to pucker okay so just, you know, so for color work, it is kind of important to do a swatch just to see what your tension is doing. And that way you can kind of adjust it when you actually start knitting. Should you do your swatch with color work flat or in the round? Um, I guess it depends on how new you are to color work. If I knit a, my very first hat um, that I knit with color work, it was in the round. I didn't swatch it and it was it was a hot mess <laughs> it was it had these really cool little birds on it but all my birds looked like they were dying <laughs> no, but they were all like this because of the whole thing puckered like that and I just I so wish I had swatched that um, but I didn't and I would have probably swatched that in the round because your tension will be a little bit different because in the round you're not coming back you know you're just going in that one direction so yeah I would probably I would do it based on what the pattern says. And should you do your swatch or even your color work project? I've heard folks say, flip it inside out 
like literally like this, you're mad BT, I'm doing circular in the round. That's what it mm-hmm. calls. For. So I think I've heard folks say, if I literally take this item and knit it inside out, yeah. how does that work? Does that even help or is that more confusing than anything? I don't, I don't know. Ooh. What do you think, Branislava? Oh, you know what? I think why people go, because I don't do really much stranded color work. I've done few pieces and I always had a little bit problem with tension. But I think why they do it, I am actually right now trying to get ready for a little example in here. But why they do it on the other side, it, I mean, like if you're knitting in the round, so they would turn it inside, you would be working on the inside. So what happens is really, oh, I wish I would go and have a, an example in the, in the round. So what, if you're knitting on the inside, but still knitting in the round, right? You basically are stretching out the floats on the outside. So on the inside, it's, little tighter your stitches but the floats are more expanded because they're on the outside they have to make bigger circle than the stitches on the inside so and then when you turn it inside you know the the right way then you have a perfect uh that's what i think is happening really but they're not all of a sudden because knitting in the round you're either knitting or purling if they flip it inside out, are they magically going, instead of doing a knit, they're purling, and instead of purling, they're knitting? They're not doing that. I'm not sure how, I've never seen, I've heard rumor of it, but I've never seen it done where people are flipping. Their also, work. how do you follow a chart if it's inside yeah. out? No, you still follow it, but you're, actually what is really happening is you're uh, knitting in the other direction. Okay but you're following the chart but the, your floats i'm going to actually when i'm editing this video in the middle i'm gonna go and show a little example i'm gonna go and this is really interesting this is so interesting that i'm gonna go and do a little tiny video just to show how it goes and works around and how it expands on the outside so basically you have the wrong side facing you and the right side is on the inside. Okay. So, Slava, I'm so take this. So basically, what you're ha- what you're doing is instead of you see the, when you're knitting over here like this on the right side, the floats are getting sh- they're 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 more shrunk because they're on the on the inside. They're making. Um, R- the ra- r- road around is lo- less so you're really making the floats tighter if you are knitting if you're knitting this way in the uh, basically in the other direction the floats are the, on the outside so you don't really have to worry as much if those floats are tight or not you understand I'm so incredibly impressed that you were like, I've like figured it out like like that because I was in the exact same stitch group with Lene. We're in the same stitch group and it was, um, we call her Honey Jane. I have a name, I have a yarn um, named after her and she's an incredibly advanced knitter. And it was, it was Honey Jane. She raises bees. Um, hence her nickname. Um, <laughs> uh, she um, she was the one that made that suggestion. And I, was that Saturday or Wednesday or whenever? I don't know. It was a while ago. And I just was so confused. I just was like, oh, I don't get it. So I'm, I'm, I'm overthinking about this. I'm just impressed. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's critical thinking. Uh, I am I'm a little crazy about these kind of things because if I get an idea in my head, I have to say it right away and it's, and I start, my brain starts and um, yeah, my family has problems with me. (laughs) 
because I'm always thinking a little bit ahead and I start telling that this is going to be like, and those poor things, they have to live with me. It's really terrible for them. So, <laughs> so, so, so that's what happened right now when uh, Liné was talking about, uh, you know, knitting with the floats on the outside. So are you still reading the chart left to right or right to left? No, you're still reading it the right way. You're you are only right knitting in the other direction, but it's going to come out exactly the same. Got it. Now I'm going to have to go practice. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm going to, I, I, and I, I am hoping that I'm going to go and make a little video and put it right there in the middle between all four of us. <laughs> so I can go and show an example. Um, yeah. I wish I could go and show it on this little piece, but, uh, you know, but I only could show it on this one here. Okay. And you can actually see here with my color work, by the way, this was, I was knitting this for uh, American Girl doll. <laughs> I did one long, this is long time ago, a skirt. Uh, but it's too big, so this would only fit newborn, but how do you go and put it over the head of a newborn, right? <laughs> I don't know. It's a little bit too tight. Anyway, so what I wanted to say, and I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> Lene had a question. Yes. So that's the perfect segue. Yes. Watches for color work. Once you've done your color work swatch, well, actually, it's maybe a combo question for Kelly and Atifa. Should you block it? When you swatch for color work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's how you would know if your tension is right or not. Okay. That's probably what I did. I did not do that for a pair of color work socks that I did for the first time ever. And in the color work row, I can feel it on my foot. It's awfully tight. But then again, I did a test knit for tennis gray and I didn't block. Then I don't swatch. I'm bad. I don't I, I will I don't check confess it. I am not a swatcher. I don't swatch anything. You're a designer. You don't have to. You know what you're doing. That's I do now, but I've learned from my mistakes because I've never swatched. <laughs> so now I know because of, you know, my dying birds on my hat that I need to leave more yarn. <laughs> so it's just, you know, I have things I can't wear because I ruined them, but I still, I like to have them to look at because I'm not going to swatch. It's just not something I'm going to do. <laughs> are there, how many different forms of color work are there, FIFA? Because I hear- Say again? How many forms of color work are there? I hear Fair Isle all the time, but then I know, and it, it popped up in the knit night, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Folks were saying that Fair Isle is one, is it, it's not really a group, but it's one pocket of color work and there's other pockets of color work well basically color work is the umbrella term or stranded color work is the umbrella term and then you have fair isle and then you have others underneath it do you know how many different forms of color work there are oh i just i was saying that they're stranded and not stranded yeah and, and then, so sorry go ahead kelly oh and i was going to add in and bronislava you should you know answer through this is that um, like Fair Isle is just a, a term for a type of color work from a particular region and like just about every culture in the world has different types of color works and different patterns associated with their cultures. Yeah it does it just depends on what um, you know uh, fiber, making fabrics, knitting, weaving, crocheting, every culture, every country has a history of, of uh, their own in terms uh, that they bring to the table. And, and I think Fair Isle is just one term for one particular region. And people use it somewhat interchangeably, but actually um, I think it's more appropriate to call it color work because, um, you know, it isn't, you know, but people do, you know, they'll say mosaic or they'll say slip stitch or they'll say stranded color work or they'll, you know, stripes or whatever it is. But um, yeah. 
And I think that all of these separate ones, like you said, mosaic, fair aisle, uh, slip, st <laughs> slip stitch, <laughs> they are really a color work. You know, they are part of, of the big, huge, uh, you know, all different kinds of techniques. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have to actually stop this podcast. Uh, the podcast is so long that I have to cut it into two parts. Uh, so this is the end of our first part for today. Look for the part number two. Also, I want to thank you for watching our podcasts and all other videos that I'm posting on my uh, YouTube channel. I want to thank you very much for commenting. Don't forget to comment. We are always looking for um, any ideas or questions. It's no problem. Uh, and don't forget to uh, visit the uh, uh, the description below the video where are all the links so you can go and follow us on social media okay and you will see us another time Bye.